Welcome everybody to uh, Happy Father's Day, by the way. Happy Father's Day, yeah. <laughs> we got a few fathers in here. We got, we got, we got the old man back. Oh, that one, that one, not the other one. <laughs> we uh, Happy Father's Day. Hope you do well for your dad. Yeah, you're welcome, sir. <laughs> uh, man. All right, we got a good word for you guys today. Right, I got a good word for you. Um, we are in a series called What Your Mama Didn't Teach You. What your mama didn't teach you. I was, yeah, we, we are saying what your mama didn't teach you. This is a, this is a series where we're, we really want uh, the, the growth of our church to, we want, we want the people, you, right, to be a group of brothers and sisters who are able to see what others cannot see, right, when you, when you deal with life. To be able to think 20 things when other people can only see two things, right? We want you guys to develop real wisdom. And wisdom is not knowledge. Wisdom is not um, simply being good. Wisdom is the combination of that, being competent to deal with the reality in which we live in, okay? And so last week, we talked about what, what does your mama always teach you? Your mama teaches you to be yourself. Mama teaches us to be ourselves. It's good to be yourself, right? Do you, you know? But the wisdom from the Bible tells us what? Tells us that there are, it's not changing your personality, but there are moments, there are times that you are not to be yourself. You are not to live in the same temperament in which you have. Let me give you an example of what I mean by that, since some of you guys weren't there last week. It means that naturally we fall under a few categories, a few areas of our natural temperament, things that we kind of go to, the thing that we kind of develop into our natural habit. Right. Sometimes we have the natural habit of just being anxious about everything. We're always worried about everything. We're always questioning everything. We're always thinking like what's the, the how, how bad things are going to be. And really just, you know what, just finding a way to be as cautious as possible in every possible situation. There's another temperament which we have is just the, the, the confrontational temperament. It's like we're just going to deal with everything. I'm just going to jump into it and just face it head on, and I'm just going to just plow my way through it, a very headstrong head, um, stubborn attitude. Or we, ha we have that temperament where we are just constantly talking and we're doing nothing. I just like to philosophize about stuff. Just talk and talk and talk, but have no actions behind it. So we, we have these natural temperaments that we go to, and that's what we are when we say be yourself. But there are moments where you shouldn't be yourself with these things. Right? Because if, if you are, let's say, for example, in a high stress, high level situation where, let's say, a bank robbery is happening, right? right the, the wise thing to do, okay, is to be an anxious person. You know, it's time to go. That's, this is, doesn't look like it's a good thing. We got to get out of there. Can you imagine a person whose temperament, who's being himself, I just want to get in there, right, and just confront this guy. It's like, yo, you want to rob a bank? Let's, let's go at it right now. Let's do it, right, and just confront the person. What happened? That's not wise. But by being yourself, you have that tendency to jump into a situation when you should be walking out of it. Or this, there's times when you're, you're trying to be yourself and you need to move forward. You need to engage. You need to step into it. You need to have the courage to do something about this, to climb over that wall, to overcome this obstacle, but because you're so anxious all the time, you don't want to confront, you don't want to face your issues, you want to run. So instead of confronting, you run away. That's your natural be yourself attitude. That's not wise. And there are times when you just talk way too much. That's all you do is you just keep talking and talking and talking and nothing gets done. There are seasons when you should be talking and discussing, but there are seasons when you need to step in and do something, right? And so what the wisdom literature tells us is that it's not good to be yourself. Your mama teaches you, be yourself, do you. But oftentimes, being yourself can actually get you into more trouble. Being yourself can actually do you more harm than do you good. You guys following me, right? Being yourself, you got... There are moments when you got to be courageous, but there's a moment you got to be cautious. There are moments when you got to step into it, and there's a moment when you got to just step back. There's a moment when you need to talk, and there's a moment when you need to do. But you got to have the wisdom to do that. And if you are constantly going to be yourself, you find yourself in situations where 
You're not competent to the reality of your life. You don't know what to do with reality. You go back to your default mode, okay? And so today, the question that comes up after that is this, well, how do I get this wisdom, Tony? I mean, how, how do I begin to develop this wisdom? How do I develop a wisdom where I am meant to be courageous in moments where I should be courageous? Or how do I develop the wisdom where I should be cautious? Or how do I develop the wisdom of when to step into it and step, step, instead of keep talking about it? How do I develop this wisdom? And today we're going to our second part, which is what mama teaches us. Mama teaches us also to do what? Listen to our hearts, right? Today I'm going to tell you, do not listen to your heart, right? Mama never taught you, right? Mama always taught you to listen to your heart. I'm going to tell you not to listen to your heart, right? And you're like, what? So hear me out, right? We're going to talk about how we develop this wisdom to deal with this stuff, okay? How we develop this wisdom. And it comes from not listening to your heart, okay? You can't not listen to your heart. Open your Bibles, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs. Proverbs is uh, it's a literature type of writing. It's about wisdom. It is the culmination of a man, a king, who has lived his life doing a lot of dumb things and recognizing those things and putting all of his wisdom into this book. Okay, all of his wisdom into this. And so that if we are to be wise, if we are to listen to it, if we are to follow it, if we are to gain from it, we will have the wisdom to be competent in the reality in which we live. That we will have the wisdom to do in situations where, situation where we think we can't do it, we're going to step up and be able to do it. And that's my heart, that you guys become wise people, right? Proverbs chapter 4, verses 11. What you're going to be reading from 11 to verse 19, we're going to be seeing this picture of a path, of a road, of a journey, right? We're going to see this picture of a person walking on it, how the Solomon tells us how to walk it, or what happens when you've walked on it the wrong way, or you're walking on the wrong path. We're going to see this journey of this the word path that keeps coming out, okay? I want you to focus in on that as we read it. Proverbs chapter 4, verses 11 to 19. Listen now. I guide you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight path. See, when you walk, your steps will not be hampered. When you run, you will not stumble. Hold on to instructions. Do not let it go. Guard it well, for it is your life. Listen, go on this path. Walk it. Do not let go from it. Listen to me, right? Do not live and it will guard your life. Do not, verse 14, set foot on the path of the wicked or walk in the ways of evil men. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it and go on your way. For they cannot sleep till they do evil. They are robbed of slumber till they make someone fall. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter to the full light of day. But the way of the wicked is like the deep darkness. They do not know what makes them stumble. How is our character developed? How is that natural default mold that we have developed? How do we actually develop those things? The Bible says this. It looks like the picture. Life is like a picture of a walkway. Life is like a picture of a path. Life is like you walking on a journey on a road. And every step you take, every daily repeated step, every daily consistent committed step you take ultimately forms your character and your destiny. What Solomon is saying, do you know how you get to that default mode of always being so uh, fearful? Do you know how you get to that default mode of always talking and doing nothing about it? Do you know how you get to that fearful, that, that default role where you're constantly uh, being obnoxious and confrontational? Do you know how you get to those mode? It's because the daily little things you do. The tiny little things you do every single day, those little steps that you take piece by piece, it leads you down that road. It shapes your character. It makes you become who you are. Ultimately, you start off thinking nothing's going to back on, come out of it, but at the end of it, what happens? You change. At the end of it, you don't even know how, you don't even know when it happened. You just know that's who you are now, right? I'll give an example of this. I'll give you an example of this. You know how like in high school, like, there are people who are just naturally smart, so they don't study. 
and they just take a test and they get an A, don't you just get so mad at them? Like you're out there, you're, you're, you're grinding your books, you're, you're reading, you're taking notes, you're doing your best, you're going to tutoring, and they, you're spending like 30 hours a week studying, they literally show up to the test, take the test, and pass it. They, don't even, they, they have not developed the path of studying, right? and, you, and you're so jealous of them. It's like, man, things look so good for them. Things look so easy for them. High school life looks so great for them. And so here they're walking. Here you're walking, and you're just trying your best. And the best you can pull off is like a B on your algebra test, and you're just mad because you spent 30 hours on that, right? And so here you're walking. You're taking these steps, and here they're just strolling through it. But let me tell you something what happens, right? See, in high school, there's a difference of educational values, intellectual abilities, because it's just a range of people. But when, when you get to college, you start weeding that intellectual difference out. And so people begin to be almost equal when you get to college. When you step in a freshman year, you're pretty much on the same plane. There may be like little dif- discrepancies here, but you're pretty much on the same plane. Let me tell you what my chemistry teacher at the greatest university on the West Coast said, right? UC Irvine, right? Dr. Rasmussen, right? He said this, right? He said, once you are here, it don't matter how smart you were in high school. Once you are here, it depends how hard you're willing to work to get through here. And there's a lot of kids in that class be like, I don't need this. I used to take tests. I used to do well. In college, you know it is. You've been there. There's only three tests that determines your school, right? Your grades. You got your first test, you got your midterm, and you got your final. That three tests determine your whole entire grade for that quarter. And so, you know, you, you get those guys like, I don't need to do this, and they step in. They don't study. So they say one lecture makes four hours of study, but they don't, they don't need to study. I don't need to study. I didn't study in high school. Why do I need to study now? For, first, they don't even know how to study, right? They don't know how to study because they haven't developed the steps of actually studying. So they don't, they, even if they wanted to, they wouldn't even know how to do it. They open the book like, yeah, I got this, right? So they take their first test, and what happens? They bomb that mug, right? And then you took the first test. Wait, what you offer, what, your B right now is way better than their D right now, right? Because, oh, man, I took, and, and on the curve, on the curve, your B is actually an A, which is even better. You're like, whoa. Why? Because your, your character has been formed from the beginning. Those tiny little steps that you took back in high school, where you were just trying your best to study, he, doing this and that, and, you, and you're putting your energy, you learned the techniques of what it looks like to study and do your lectures, and all of a sudden you go into school. You know how to put in the work. Even though it's hard, you know how to put in the work. Versus someone who's developed the default mode of, I got this, and it ends up failing, right? And so the Bible is telling you this. Do you know how you get into that place where your default mode is to run or your default mode is to be confrontational or just to talk too much? You don't get there overnight. It's not like you wake up and that's you. You got there because you took those steps to get there. You got there because you, you took those baby steps. You kept choosing that road. And eventually, you're doing it. The Bible says what? You're doing it. You don't even know that you're doing it. Look at verse 14. Verse 14 and 15, it looks like that in the beginning, you have a choice to make. In the beginning, it's telling you have a, uh, you have a choice to go left or right, set your foot here, set your foot there, right? For, look at verse 14. It says this. Do not set foot on the path of the wicked or walk on the way of evil. You have a choice. Don't do it. You can choose or not to choose it. Avoid it. Do not travel on it. Turn from it. Go on your way. There's a choice available at 14, 15. But then what happens when you keep choosing the wrong way? Verse 16. For those who walk that way, those who eventually keep going that way, the path of the wicked, the path of foolishness, the path of default. They cannot sleep till they do evil. They are robbed of slumber till they make someone fall. They eat the bread of wickedness and drink the wine of violence. You know what this, that's, a, that's, that's poetic language to, to, to indicate someone who has been so caught up, so addicted. That's addictive language. What that means is this. You've gone so deep into it, you don't even know how you got there. It just becomes a natural default action for you. A natural default action to what you're doing. Let me show you how you know you're there, okay? Let me explain to you at this moment how you know you're walking on that road right now, right now, okay? Because when you are taking those steps, those moments by moment, where it's shaping and moving and, and changing your character and your destiny, this is how you know you've, t- you've taken the wrong path because at this point in your life, you blame everybody for what's going on in yours, right? You're not taking a, you're not making a choice 
to fix and take responsibility, you are in a place where you are blaming everybody. You're blaming your parents for their upbringing. You're blaming so-and-so for what's going on. You're, making, you're saying, you know what? I could have done better if I did that. I could have had more if I had that. You're pointing fingers at everybody except for yourself. You're playing the victim. You are the victim. Everybody else is the enemy. You've come to a place where you can't even figure out what way to go anymore. So the best way for you to go is to say, you know what? It's everyone else's problem. And what do you do? You try to bring everyone down to your level. Or you, 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 you uh, get into that self-pity mode where you're like, you know, I'm, well, I'm not like them. I didn't get their blessings like they did. I, didn't, I wasn't raised the way they did. I wasn't given that when I was growing up. I wasn't shown that. That's why I'm here. You play the victim card. You see, the little steps you take, the little things you do, leads you to your default mode. And your default mode is that you blame people. You blame others. You point your fingers at them. You say, it's their fault, not mine. It's nothing to do with me. All right? You become self-absorbed with who you are. Things are going wrong in your life. Things are going bad in your life, and you don't even know the reason for it. All you can say is what? You're like 16, that you cannot sleep till you do evil. You, you're robbed of your slumber till you make someone fall. Right? You want to bring people to your level because it feels good when they're at your level. You want to see them fall with you. We do this naturally because we're all Asian. You know when we take a test and we fail it? What do we tell our parents? It was a hard test. Everybody failed, right? Everybody failed. Mom, dad, it wasn't just me. It was everybody. Because if your mom found out one person did well, they'd be like, how come you didn't do it like that, right? How come you weren't, how come you, you know, how come you're not like your sister's third cousin's best friend, right? They did that really well. How come you didn't do it well? And so you say, you know, everybody failed. It was so hard because you want to bring everyone to your level. Because your default mode is what? You don't take response because oh, I didn't study. No, no, no it's not that because you didn't study. It's because everybody else, because the test was hard. The teacher was difficult. You're not competent to reality because why? What happens when you get into real life? You're going to say, oh, yeah, my boss is really bad. Well, then you're fired. Bye. Right? Oh, it's not, it's not my fault. Right? It's their fault. You see that? You get into that mode, and now you're living in life. You're living the actual reality, and you're blaming everybody else. How did you get there? The tiny little steps. The tiny little choices you make. The tiny little moments that you, uh, that you embarked upon led you down that road. The little daily choices is setting your destiny and it's forming your character. That's what's happening. That's what's going on. Right? And so where do we go from here? And so, and so it comes to the question like, well, how do I fix that? Right? How do I fix that? Because I was just listening to my heart. Oh, yeah. Right? Mama told me to listen to my heart. Everybody told me, listen to my heart. That's, that's why I went down that road, because I was listening to my heart. I needed to do that, so that's why I was going where my heart was telling me to go. Right? Actually, the only time I was good to listen to your heart was today, right, when Germany played Mexico, right? And then everyone thought Germany was going to win, but the heart, the heart tells you Mexico's going to do it, and then they did it. Wow, that was amazing. I didn't believe it, right? But anyways, right? So, so here you are. You're, lis you're, you're listening to your heart to direct your future. You're saying, That's, I'm, I'm, I, I want to go with what's going on here so that I can get there. Can, I get, can you give me 15 minutes? Let me, let me break it down to you in 15 minutes why you should not listen to your heart. I know what mama teaches us. I know what this mama of the world teaches us, but let me give you 15 minutes. Let me tell you what the Bible tells you about your heart, okay? Give me 15 minutes. Look, look at verse 20. Look at verse 20. My son, pay attention to what I say. Listen closely to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and a health to a man's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. He says, you got to guard this. You got to guard what's coming out of here because your thoughts, your love comes out of this. Right? What you love ultimately comes from this. And so you cannot change your character overnight. You have to figure out 
what's going on in here. You got to ask the question, what is actually driving those quest, those steps? What is actually driving those decisions? What is getting you to get to that default mold of yours, right? What is your ultimate love? See, the heart, the Bible says, is the wellspring of life, where from the heart comes life. From the heart comes how you live your life. From the heart comes your character. From your heart comes your destiny, okay? It's not, it's not a matter of just duties and memorizing. It's not a matter of willing through your life path. It's this. This is what's driving it. If you don't have an idea what's going on in here, it doesn't matter how willful, how strong-willed you are. It does not matter how uh, Focus you are. You're not going to get out of the situation when you're moving towards that path. Let me give you an example. Let me, let me tell you what I mean. Whatever your heart tells you is its ultimate love. Whatever your heart tells you what it really wants, that is going to drive the rest of your choices and the decisions in the future. You say, I want to listen to my heart because everyone tells me to listen to my heart. Go with my gut. But the Bible is going to tell you don't listen to your heart. Don't listen to her, for the heart is very deceitful. I'll give an example. Check it out. If, for example, your heart tells you the thing that's going to give you value, the thing that's going to give you identity, the thing that's going to make you feel like you're worth something, like you have something, is your work, your job, the title of it, the prestige of it, right? the results of it. If your heart keeps telling you, you are nobody until you get that job. You are nobody until you get the job that's going to actually look right. You are nothing without it. What drives your decision then? What's going to drive these steps? What's going to make these paths? What's going to form your character? That. Because why? You're going to make choices. Listen, you're going to make choices that's going to push your family away. You're not going to spend time with your family because why? You got to work. I got to get there. I can't get there if I'm taking the weekends off. Uh uh. I got to work during the weekends. I, ca I can't get there if I'm coming home at night to have dinner with the family. I got to work through the night. I got to push. I got to make it happen. You're going you're gonna to push away your friends. It's like you, you guys aren't helping me. Right? You, you, guys are, you guys aren't helpful to my situation right now. So you push your friends aside. Ultimately, what? You push your health aside. Your health doesn't matter anymore. And the thing that you wanted so badly, the thing that your heart loved so much, because it was the ultimate love of your heart, it ultimately destroys you. The thing that you want to pursue so deeply down the road, it actually destroys you because you do whatever it takes to have it. I'll give you a great example of that. Let me give you an example. My mom, okay? Great woman. She works seven days a week, okay? Seven days a week. She, she does nails. Okay, she does nails. She 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 works with accents. She breathes that mug in every day. She doesn't even have fingerprints. You guys know that? If she get caught, they can't find her because her fingerprints has been rubbed off by acetone for like the past 20 years of working. You know? And so like, so I'm like, mom, I'm gonna give you a deal. I'm gonna make a deal with you, mom. It's like a great deal. You should take this deal. She's like, what's the deal? Take take two days off. How much do you make in two days? I'll double it. I will double your. I will give you in cash for your two days worth of work. You just have to take those two days off. You know what she said? She said, I can't. I can still work. Let me work. I can still work. Let me work. So you would work those two days rather than stay home with your grandson, your only son, right? Your daughter-in-law. I mean, I, I get it. Grandma's there, but that's okay. Let's just leave her aside. But it's your grandson, your son, and your daughter. Would you would really take that time. And you know what happens? You know what happens? When Seth doesn't like, acknowledge her, like her love, like, hey, Seth, love grandma? And he's like, mm, right? He does that mm, thing, right? She said, like, how could you? I bought you yogurt, right? And I was, like, he, grandma, he, mom, I was like, mom, he doesn't even know you. He doesn't even know you. He sees you for like 30 minutes. You're, pr you're practically like church people to him. Like he barely, actually, no, church people even more than him because they see him way more than you do, right? They're probably like his grandparents by now, you know? You know, and she, she was like, mm, whatever, you know? I ain't going to buy you no more bananas, right? And he's like, stop talking, grandma, right, you know? But that's what, happen what's what happens when your ultimate love, when your identity, when your value becomes your work. Your decisions, your default decisions take you down that road where it forms your character. And even when your son offers you a great deal, I mean, who would take that deal? I would take that deal. If someone tells me, take the weekend off, I'll pay you double. I will take the deal. 
right? But not someone who's, whose heart is to say, my job is my life. I can't take a week. I can't take an hour off. You see that? And ultimately, pushing family away, pushing friends away, right? Destroying your health. Now, you wanted that work so much now, it actually killed you. You, you can't even work well now because of it. All right, give me another example. What if out of the heart, what if the ultimate love from your heart is a romance relationship, right? What if, what if somewhere in your heart you says, I can never be happy unless I am married. I will never be happy unless I have a person next to me. That the existence of my joy comes from having a personal relationship with the opposite sex, someone who's next to me, right? When that becomes your focal point, what's going to happen? The path you pick, the choices you make, it's going to lead you down the default mode where then you end up picking guys whose standards, without, your standards end up because you get so picky or you can't find them, your standards become this low. It becomes ultimately low. You say, doesn't matter, you know, he's breathing. <laughs> That's good enough for me. That is good for me, right? You set the bar so low rather than saying, you know what? Oh, no, let's not get there yet, okay? So you set the bar so low. Or, or you end up just jumping from one guy to the next, to the next, to the next, to the next. And that love that you are looking to find, right? That love that you see on the Korean dramas or whatever dramas you watch that you want so much, right? That love triangle, like I love him, but she loves her and then he loves him, right? It's like this really weird triangle. Right, don't say that. I'm sorry. Right, right, so, right, right, I lost myself, right? Right, like it's, it's like 21st century, it happens, okay? So like it's like, this, this, it's like this, this weird thing, but you want it so much, but you don't realize that what? After, that's cute for like maybe a year, like, you know, like, oh, it's such a star-crossed lover. And then 50 years of that? I don't think so, right? Like, I'm, this is over. But if you continue to go down that road, if that's your ultimate love, that, if that is what your heart is telling you, I will never be somebody unless I have that. I will never be fool or happy unless I have that. I will never have that fullness of who I am unless I have that love. Your choices begins to be like that. You, you make these, these you, you walk down this path, this way, you get to this default mold where well, the only thing you're thinking about, the decisions you're making is, well, you know what, I shouldn't, I shouldn't go to the East Coast, right, because I know the work and the stuff is out. I know there's purpose for me out there, but you know, but what if I can find the guy in the, w I want a West Coast guy, right? I want one of them out here. I don't know, I don't like those East Coast dudes. Right? I want them here, right? And so you start making decisions thinking like, what if I get married? Like, what if you don't get married? I don't know, right? Like, but your decisions begins to be driven by that. Your choices are made by that. That's your default mode, right? That's why the Bible says what? Don't listen to your heart. Right? But everyone around you is telling you, listen to your heart. Do you listen to that? Give me another example. One last example. What if, what if the ultimate love of your heart, what if the ultimate desire for your heart is money? That, that you will not feel like you, you came from a ghetto home, you came from a house that had nothing, you really lived in one bedroom apartment with eight brothers and sisters, right? And you're just like, I just need to get out. I need to actually make a name for myself. I need to have a lifestyle that I can actually enjoy. And so your ultimate love, the thing that gives you identity, your worth, your value, is the amount of zeros you have on your paycheck. And so what happens when that, when, when that ultimate love is there? You start making decisions. You start going down that path that is, is driven by that. You start picking a lifestyle which you cannot afford, but you want to have that so you can look like you have that lifestyle, right? You, you start making yourself seem, you start exploiting people in order to keep it. So your decision ends up making you go down a job that you don't want with no purpose. You burn out in that work job just because, but it pays well. Gives me an extra zero. So this desire for that job, or that, uh, the finances, ends up being what? It ends up being your destruction. See, the Bible says this. The reason why we go down that road, the reason why our character and our destiny is set is because you have made decisions listening to your heart. You have made decisions listening to the natural tendency of your heart. And ultimately, as you walk down that road, you will get to a place making decisions only for that. Your default mode, your default decision-making mode is for that. I cannot do anything unless I have that. Everything revolves around that. 
And so we come in, and we hear the story, like we hear the, 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 the picture like this. If anything but God is the basis of your identity, listen, if anything but God is the basis of your identity, you will find yourself losing everything you want. Why? Money is a lot better than God. Me, I can see money. I mean, romance is better than God. At least I have a girlfriend next to me or a boyfriend next to me. Tell me work is better than God. At least I have something to do. All right? Why is God the basis of my identity? Why would that be the basis? Because there's only one thing that made you. And if God is who he says he is, he is the only thing that knows you. He's the only thing that knows your heart. He's the only thing that knows what drives it, what it needs, and what it does not need. He's the only one who actually can make you flourish. Everything else is created. Everything else is made by men. Everything else is created in this world. See, God is the one who is breathing to that. So if you, when you begin to make God your identity, then you start making choices, better choices. When you, when you make God your center, then you're going to start thinking about your work. What work am I going to pick that's going to give purpose and value? But I'm not going to pick the job if it's going to take me away from my family on the weekends. Right? I'm going to pick a job. I'm going to pick something that's going to give me my worth, my value, that's, that's going to have purpose, but it's not going to kill me. When you think about finances, you, you, no matter how many zeros, maybe you have three less zeros or three more zeros, when you have your finances and God is the center of that, your finances doesn't define you. Right? Whether you have a little bit, you're happy, or you're satisfied, you have, you have a lot, you know what to do with it. There is not a determining factor by it. Or romance, you don't need someone to tell you who you are. You don't need someone to make you feel like you're somebody. Right? When God is defining role. So here Solomon tells us what? The reason you get to your default mode is because the little steps you take on the path of life. Your character, your destiny is determined by those little steps. But I took those steps by listening to my heart. That's the problem. Don't listen to your heart. That's why he got you to where you are. That's why your decision-making skills is in the default mode. That's why if you keep going down the road further, you will see it uglier. Right? And so we come to, to the final part of this, verse 24 to 27. And Solomon says, put away perversity from your mouth. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Make level paths for your feet. Take only ways that are firm. <clears throat> do not swerve to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. What are you telling me to do, Tony? Are you telling me I'm supposed to like take this book and then just do it and then just will my way through the work of it? Are you just telling me that I should just try to be a good person? Are you just telling me that I just need to follow the instructions word for word and then things will go straight for me? Things will go right for me? That my character will all of a sudden change? No. Your character cannot change by your will. Your character came from your heart. So the only thing that's going to fix that is your heart. The only thing that's going to fix it has to come from the heart. Something has to transform the heart. Something has to change what's going on here. Something has to make your heart look at to it and say, that's more beautiful than anything else. That is more worth it than anything else. That, if I have that, is, sat is more satisfying than anything else. And 2,000 years ago, so this whole thing is like, it's like, it's a way. What's the way, PT? What's the way? What's the job? What's the, what's the work I need to do? What, what? Um, skill sets do I need to develop? What am I supposed to do? Just tell me and I'll do it. Let me tell you, what's the way, right? I'll tell you what's the way. 2,000 years ago, a teacher walked with his 12 students, right, to Jerusalem. One of, the 12, one of the students said, Philip, he said this, he said, teach me the way and I'll walk it. Just show me where to go and I'll go. I don't know where to go. Where do I go? And Jesus Christ looks at him and he says, Philip, I am the way the truth, and the life. I am the way. That way that you're looking for, I am that way. The way that turns things, that, that is, is to get your heart to see it as more beautiful, I am that way. What way are you supposed to walk? Walk to me. That's what's going to change your character. That's what's just going to change your heart. That's what's going to change your destiny. And that is what's going to get you wise. 
because you're no longer going to your default mode of decision making based on whatever your ultimate love is. Your default mode of decision making is going to be based upon the beauty of who Jesus Christ is and what he has done for you. You see, 2,000 years ago, this is what Jesus says. He says, I will not stop and so I bring them home. I see them wavering. I see them wandering. I see them like sheeps without shepherds. I will go and I will bring them home. I will go and I will set them on the path. I will show them what the path is. I will give them a picture of beauty that they can never believe in seeing. So beautiful that if they can open their eyes and see it, it will transform everything, money, children, family, love, it will look pale in comparison. I will give them this beauty, and that beauty is me. I will give my life, and I will give them my position. I will bring them home. Do you know how that works? Do you know, do you know how it works when Jesus Christ becomes beautiful to your heart? This, this is what happens here, okay? When Jesus Christ, when you, when you recognize your position, your place, and what he is driving you and moving you towards, when you, when you recognize who you are, your heirs to the Son of God, your, your, your heir, co-heirs with Jesus Christ to God the Father, you are given that position and be able to live in that position when you recognize that. Listen, when you recognize that, then all of a sudden you're thinking, why do I need a job to define who I am? Why do I need to beat somebody to get first place and move ahead? Why do I need to manipulate and exploit people to move forward when I already know who I am? I already know my position. I can have this job, do well in this job, do great in this job, be a blessing in this job, and not have to worry about making, getting a job that's going to give me more worth and more value because I already have worth and value. Who cares about the riches of this everything around me when I have the riches of the king? Who cares about the love of a boyfriend or a girlfriend when I have the love of the father? You see, when you, when you begin to understand that he brought you into that place, that what he has done, has, he has made you an heir with him to the father. Do you understand that? When you know that, you are sons and daughters of the most high. It's like this. It's like someone passed away. They wrote your name on their will. You're a millionaire, but you don't know it yet. You don't know it yet. Right? Someone wrote your name. When I die, I bequeath all my possessions, which is worth, net worth $57 million, to so-and-so. It's yours. And it, you already have it. It's in the, they're looking for you, right? And when you recognize that you have it, you're not going to be like, oh, man, yeah, I have $57 million. All right, let's just go back to, like, you know, worrying about my, you know, day-to-day -day job. Yeah, that's, that makes sense. Oh, I have 57 million. Let me, let me beat this dude up over the 10,000 bonus that I'm going to get from him, right? Oh, whoa, whoa, wait. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have 57 million, right? I'm loved by this person. Oh, no, I, I need you to be in my life because I don't feel like I'm important. Someone thought I was important enough to write this will for me. Someone thought I was important enough to actually put me in this position. You see, when you take on that, then you begin to realize what? I'm not going to die over a job. I'm not going to let my job and the future of it, the love for it, direct my decisions and my future. I'm not going to make a life decision based upon whether it's going to affect my work or not. I'm not going to make a life decision based on whether it's going to affect my love interest or not. I'm not going to make a life decision based upon whether it's going to affect my um, financial interest, my children. I'll make a decision for the good because I can because I'm in the position to. I'm in position to make decisions for good. And that's what Jesus says, I am the way. And so when you step, now wherever you've been, if you begin to say, God, if you are the way, then let me step that way. And you start walking on that path. It's not gonna be, it's not gonna be overnight. That mug is, you don't turn on holiness like a light switch. That thing's gonna take a while. But as you step in, day by day, as you begin to take on the job, take on the position, take on the role, as you begin to ask the question, God, why are you telling me to do this? It seems kind of weird. It seems kind of odd. The father, the psalmist is saying, listen to my words. Pay attention to it. Walk this road. It's like, why? It doesn't seem like it's a great road. It doesn't seem like it's fun. It doesn't seem like it's paying off. Walk this road. And then the beauty of hindsight, isn't it the beauty of hindsight? It's always 2020. When you look back and you realize what? That was a good call. 
But that was a good call. I didn't see it then. I was so blind. But that was a good call. All right? Tiny little steps. When we begin to walk towards the way to him, then your decisions, then the things that you start thinking about, then the things that you start thinking further about, it's going to be wise. It's going to be wise. When you start thinking about work, you're going to make a wise decision about work. When you start thinking about your relationship, you're not going to pick the next guy that breathes. You're going to be wise about the person you pick. Right? When you, when you, when you pick about financial gains, you're going to be wise about it. You're not going to jump into a thing, I'm going to make the six figures. I want that. But you're going to be wise about it. What is necessary now? What is necessary later? All right? What your mama didn't teach you was this. She didn't teach you not to listen to your heart. The Bible says the heart is deceitful. If God is not the identity or the wellspring of this heart right here, it's not the ultimate love, your direction, your walk, your path, it's going to lead you down to this default mode over and over. Where the only thing you keep making decisions about is, oh, I can't do that because it's going to affect my uh, husband. Or I can't do that because it's going to affect my job. Or I can't, make, I can't get out on the weekends. My job doesn't let me. Or I, can't, I can't do that during this time because, you know what, it's gonna, I'm going to lose my whole bonus if I do that. Every decision becomes based upon your default mode versus what? Yeah, it doesn't matter. All right? It doesn't matter. I'm not going to get a job that's going to kill my family. I'm not going to make a decision that's going to keep me away from community. I'm going to go into it. So my prayer, guys, okay, check your heart. What's driving it? What's your ultimate love? What's the thing that's causing you to walk down the path of default decision-making? Let's lift it up to God right now. Let's bow our heads.